Hello, everybody. Turn this up in my headphones, Charles. Turning it up. Hello, 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 everybody, one and all. Welcome to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, and not just any fantasy today, because today we are going back to one of our most favorite Mm. series, to one of our most favorite segments on a series, and that would be our first law character studies from the great joe abercrombie these characters man i'm so excited to be back and focusing on yet another one of abercrombie's beautiful beautiful characters yes these first law character profiles are so much fun somehow we let west sit way past when we got We're doing done with west, our yeah. read of the yes our, sorry call him west <laughs> he's finally getting his time to shine over here everyone knows his reputation uh, first through the breach of oriak first and all the of that of the oriak. right of oriak not the oriak oriak <laughs> <laughs> so okay okay well let me do my uh because i didn't get too tempted to jump right in with him oh but, yeah <laughs> this is a good time so we are going to get into spoilers through the first three books of the first law world that's the original first law trilogy it, that's um geez uh, that's a blade itself before they are hanged and last argument of kings nice. if you haven't yet read those three books books then now is a good time to turn this down in your headphones if you don't want to get anything spoiled Mm. for you but if you are one of the lucky folks who has read the first law original trilogy you're in the right place here because we are going to get down to the nitty gritty of furious oh oh, yes we are (laughs) so turning this down in your headphones now because we're getting into it and I just wanted to get out there that, like, you guys didn't think that we would forget about Colm Wes. I mean, we've done every yeah. single POV character in the first law. We've done Logan. We've done Glockta, Jazal, Pharaoh, Baez, Dogman. But there's Ooh. one in the mix that we have yet to discuss. And you may have thought that we overlooked him, but that is... Not true. Not true. We love Colum West and we are so excited to get into him and his character. To me, he punches above his weight when you think about his screen time and like how mm. how much impact he has on the overall story in this world. His some of these scenes that he's in are just so iconic. Iconic. And I can't yeah. and I cannot wait to get into the gritty details. Yeah, I'm pumped, Charles. I think that... So I'm seeing here, uh, you're thinking about this kind of through a frame of the the price of duty Mm. with West's arc. I know, was it the price of loyalty that we did with the Dogman? That was one of our favorite episodes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. And I I like this, the price of duty with West here. It's... West's arc has been always a hard one for me to pinpoint exactly what it's all about because... It's a lot of it, you know, we are, we're in full spoiler territory here. So, you know, it it does end with kind of the senseless death in the whole bi- aftermath of the bias stuff. So part of the story seems for his arc and what it's about seems to be the, like the pointlessness of it. So we'll mm-hmm. see. I know we usually try to have almost like a thesis uh, going yeah. on of yeah. what we think the arc is about. And West has always felt like the hardest one to place, but I do love this this framing you're using here, Charles, the price of duty, because I, I think it fits. Let's see where it takes us. I think it fits too. You know, there's a lot, there's a few other things going on with Ness, West. You know, we're talking about the senselessness, as you had brought up, uh, of his ultimate demise. And I think that's a really important part of this. And I almost think that that 
gets into this idea of duty because, you know, like the senselessness of war and violence and things like that, which Mm. Abercrombie subtly does Mm. weave into here. So I think they're related. And let's not get ahead of ourselves by jumping to West Death because before that happens, so many other amazing things happen through the first law. And the first thing that I wanted to get through is the blade itself. We open on West where he's hiding his annoyance with Jazal, who is complaining about training for the contest. Jazal, any kind of physical effort is an affront to his nature. He's whining, he's complaining. And Wes is thinking about like how easy Jazal's training is, how much harder Jazal had to work. And all of that comes down to... Uh, this be, this is how we're introduced to Wes. He sees Jazal born into nobility and having an easier life, kind of squandering his opportunities where Wes had to pull himself up by his bootstraps, being born uh, below the nobility and having to rise the ranks of society through hard work. Yeah, and I've always thought about Wes's arc through that kind of lens of this he's a fish out of water in that union society and it's you know it's a very joe abercrombie way of telling the fish out of water story where it's like in a typical fish out of water story they seem to like figure out that this is kind of who they are and get a part of it and that's how they like they find that part of their identity and that's how they're able to do it successfully and west fish out of water story is just like no he literally does it by just like gritting his teeth and grinding (laughs) through every single moment and he's it drives him nuts because west does have this more i think he just sees how silly and stupid really the a lot of the union's social norms and rules are Mm -hmm. but he also comes from this really tough background with abusive parents and not being noble and he's had to he's had to know the rules of the game even if he thinks they're silly and grit his teeth bear it and play Mm -hmm. and we see how that affects him as a person because he's uh you know there's only so much gritting one's teeth that one can do before they have these outbursts and i think that's uh, you know, that's kind of a lot of what we deal with with West it, trying to f- deal with the society early on. Um, oh, yeah. We don't see that burst quite yet. We see, uh, yeah, uh, we we see more of his like trying to take other people's perspectives mm-hmm. and trying to be a nice person and really mm-hmm. working hard at it. And I always thought of him too, Charles, as this like this, um, I think of him as like the character that seems like the most straightforward good guy yes, the first read yes, early that's on. What I was, that was, I, that's what I was going to say now because you brought up all these great points about you know his perspective of like playing the game because he just wants to succeed in society even if he's not bought into the idea that it makes any sense or, any, or that these people are <laughs> worth like impressing at all. But he right. just wants to live a more comfortable life. And the other thing that this does though, this like pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of thing it presents Mm -hmm. Wes and like you said in this very endearing way we like Wes because like oh here's a guy who's willing to put in some honest work and build himself up in a society that's just totally stagnant and out of touch and, and like so muddled in bureaucracy and and like classism that they can't even function properly anymore and here's Wes working really hard just like succeeding by grinding and that makes him very endearing and Abercrombie is setting him up this way to have these heavy hitting moments later on but what I love about Wes is he always comes back to this he's always true to this he just has these bad moments that pop in throughout and when, when we get to them we can talk about them but to me it's just what makes Wes so fascinating because he's never not like the guy who worked really hard and rose to the ranks through hard work and is very noble and all that, but he does, you know, horrible things too, like domestic abuse and murder and all these other things. But, you know, it's, 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 it's really brilliant. And that is all kind of his rage is kind of bottled into this, like channeled through this already 
character already Ooh. arrives in Adjua, and like you would think Wes is doing a lot of this to rise up the ranks. So one of his excuses is always like, oh, look at this nice house we live in. Like you're higher up in society. Mm. You can marry someone nice. But the minute he actually has the opportunity to spend time with her up oh, duty calls, got to go to war in the north. You know, so it's like, what are you doing? You're trying to rise the ranks and all it's doing is stressing you out and keeping you away from your family. Yeah, and that's a great point, Charles, because I think this is classic Abercrombie character stuff of like, what's the story that you're telling yourself about what you're doing and what is the thing that your behaviors actually indicate about what you're doing out in the real world? And in West's head, he's like, I'm making a better life for me and my sister and we're all going to be happy and like, this is worth it and that kind of stuff. But it's like, yeah, well, dude, if you actually cared about your sister, then maybe you'd spend a little bit of time with her and he just leaves her by herself all the time while he chases his own dreams of accomplishment and i think uh, from there's some stuff in the text that indicates that uh, that west basically was like getting reminded of his messed up childhood and upbringing by Artie's sheer presence yes and for that reason in part he he basically wanted no part of her but in his head he still wanted to be a good person so he was like oh like yeah i'll set her up in this house and i'll ask like uh, bad mistake here west i'll ask giselle dan luther oh, gosh, yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like to show her around or whatever it's like he's in his head like definitely trying to be a good person and I think he he tries as hard as anyone and gets almost as close as anyone in an Abercrombie novel. But at the same time, he's, you know, uh, he's as flawed as anyone else and, and has these really rough moments, like you mentioned, Joel. So well said. And that's a huge piece of it. I love the Artie West relationship. And, like, there's some moments coming up that I can't wait to get to. But before we do that, you know, this is another thing, like you said, Wes asks Giselle to like to watch over her and Wes even warns Giselle at one point like oh Artie's suffered enough in her life doesn't need a rich nobleman toying with her emotions I mean meanwhile you could argue that he's kind of this rich nobleman toying with her emotions as well you know (laughs) he just can't see that because he's bought into this story that he's told himself like you've referred to he's the one that's like inviting her and then abandoning her and then leaving her with other people and not hanging out with her and acting embarrassed by her. So it's like all these mixed signals that have really caused Artie to be isolated and go through this downward spiral uh, emotionally. So it's like, okay, uh, you're warning to Zal, but you're not listening to yourself. And that's something we get with a lot of Abercrombie characters is they don't take their own advice and, you know, they don't, have that self-awareness and and this is Wes's kind of irony here is what he's so worried about Giselle that he's not seeing the damage that he's doing to Artie this whole time every scene we get with Artie in these beginning moments she kind of is just floating around the city mm. and, and like randomly meeting with Logan randomly meeting with Glockta randomly running into Giselle and she's just like oh I'm just alone drink like I'm trying to get his attention by drinking and getting drunk and he's not even barely registering that I'm doing that and it, it, it's so fascinating and it just speaks to this this subtle side of West's character it's like yeah this is one of these hero types self-starter mm. everything virtuistic that we like in a person yet and he's showing up the nobility which everyone likes but here he is like mm-hmm. ignoring all the warning signs of his someone in his family yeah that's really well said charles it's it's a kind of thing that uh, i think i just remember my first read with with west having this feeling like uh, it was before I'd really read a lot of Grimdark. I, it might have been my first Grimdark novel as the blade itself. Mm-hmm. And then I was kind of searching for what you usually get in just <laughs> in fantasy stories outside of the more 
grimdark stuff where I was like, okay, but who's the hero? Who's the one I'm going to latch on to? It's not mm-hmm. like I was like, it's not just all. It's not it, yeah. like this Logan guy has a really bloody past. Like I'm kind of warming up to him though with these acts. Like that was kind of where I was at. And I was like, oh yeah, this West guy, like he's the one. Um, so, but yeah, it's very easy to get stuck in that same narrative of what they're telling themselves and, and to do what West is doing, which is like lose track of Artie and how she's how she's spiraling and she's left with only just all for company and right <laughs> we right. can speculate on how much company that is <laughs> yeah i know i know and like you said it, it, he's the straight edge right he's like the he's like the straight man character for so long for this mm-hmm. and and he even you know gets there's these moments with Lord Marshal Burr where he's like, I want you on my personal staff. We need a capable military yeah. man. Like this army lacks experienced, capable people. And yes. that's why I want you working for me directly so we can actually maybe mobilize these soldiers and do something good in this war. And Wes is like, oh my gosh, all my hard work and determination. Like I've sacrificed family for this and I've got it. And like, this is it. I've, like this is a so beyond where I was. I'm allowed to go from my birth station. It's hard to even comprehend. Yet here I am, and we love that about Wes. And he's such a straight edge. But what happens right after that? He goes home. Artie's drunk, and he goes mm. into rage. And I don't think it's any coincidence that these scenes go right after each other. Because with Abercrombie, when something's hmm. going great for a character, you have to kind of be like, oh, God, <laughs> this is not going to be good. And this is one of those times. It's like we're being built up to see Wes. Like, good for you, Wes. You worked hard. You were determined. You recognized the faults of the this bureaucratic society. And you rose the ranks. And then what does Abercrombie do? He sends Wes home. And writes this, probably my favorite, like, prose in the whole of Blade Mm. itself. I think this is the most well-written scene in the whole book, I think. And it's been a while since I've read it, but this scene is just so impactful where they're in the house and Artie's drunk trying to goad him. And they're talking about their father and how he was a drunk, but he also had a rage. And you can see in these moments that they inherited some of these bad traits from their father and it's it's glashing out and it, it goes against west's all what west's repressed rage it, it, it brings a new light into this character i don't know this scene where they're together and west just like puts her up against the wall and hits her like multiple times i want to oh. say is like so powerful and it's it's it all comes back to him repressing rage and worrying about how her actions will affect his standing right and I don't know. It's yes. beautiful. Sadly Ye- beautiful. Twisted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get what you mean. Joss. Abercrombie it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's twisted, but the way it's written is so beautiful. And at the moment that always stuck out to me, and this is like, this is just the brilliance of Abercrombie's character writing and just like, in like, uh, generational trauma and how these patterns can play out for people uh, is uh, so we have that brutal moment of domestic violence and uh, it's like he first off he uh, he like excuses Jazal because Jazal is a, a like he's he calls him uh, a word I won't say on our clean podcast, but it's, it starts with an S. Um, it's just all I'd let him down and badly that ungrateful crap. Uh, <laughs> but it was hardly right. But it was hardly that shocking. The man was an ass. You keep your wine in a paper bag. You shouldn't be too upset when it leaks, which is like such a like, yeah, we know who Jazal is, but also like. Jazal's your friend. Why are you excusing him? Mm. It's just another like West, like, oh, like, yeah, like, well, whatever. It's not, it's not Jazal's fault. Like, that's a story you're telling yourself. And then he, yeah, he hits Artie and just leaves her all messed up. And she ends up saying to, he, um, he's like very afterward. He's mm. like very upset he did this because West, when he's not furious, is a very, like, he really wants to be a good person. There's a moment where it's like, he says, Artie, uh, he jerks back, and he says, I'm sorry. And she says, he was always sorry. Don't oh. you remember? 
He'd hold us and cry afterwards. Always oh, sorry, man. but it never stopped him the next time. Have you forgotten? And West says, no, I, I remember. And it's like, you can't just do whatever the hell you want and then say, I'm sorry. Like it's this so is, good. yeah, right. And it's <laughs> beautifully written. And it just, because it's Abercrombie, it's part of his brilliance is this like, he can make you laugh. Like you think you're just kind of in this like, like you're in Giselle's perspective and he's dropping those like, uh, oh, and Giselle dimly became aware that maybe he's have a, had a privileged life. You're like laughing and you get these moments like that, like Giselle, like it's like leaving wine in a paper bag. Like, and then it just creeps up on you with these almost jarring moments of just like, now you're witnessing familial abuse that has played out for generations. And it's like, this is the, like, you almost can forget what kind of book you're reading. So it's, that's, Abercrombie can make you feel so much. And I mean, those, that moment to me, every time I read it, it just sticks out as, as this, like, really poignant, like, messed up, jarring, but beautifully written moment. Yeah, this, this moment, like, stands out so uniquely in this book. I, I can't quite place it. It's, it's, it's more written like a drama, whereas the rest of the book is this, like, yeah. ironic comedy, almost. And then all of a sudden, it hits you with this super serious, like, right. dramatic piece. And you're like, man, out of context, this is, like, an amazing scene, just in general. You know, you could walk into right. this scene and be moved by it. And it's, it, it it's some of his best early work for sure and yes really oh and yeah oh yeah go ahead i don't know if i mentioned like and if folks haven't read the books for a little while and i don't know if we mentioned explicitly that like it it goes on to become clear that he the he was always sorry was west uh west and Artie's father yeah who abused both of them yes um, an alcoholic uh, violent guys and so you can tell that it's affected both of them because you know Artie. Had, you know, yeah, tr- is a heavy drinker, and um, so, so yeah, you can see the damage can I drop the father's more, done. Yeah, yeah, I'll drop one more quote, kind of him reflecting on it after, which is while he had been playing with swords and kissing the arses of people who <laughs> despised him, she had been suffering. A little effort was all it would have taken, but he could never face it. Every minute he had spent with her, he felt like the. He felt the guilt, like a rock in his gut, weighing him down, unbearable. Mm. So, and it's like, yeah, you forget, because we always think of, like, wh- when we think about prose, especially here on the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast, we yeah, think yeah. about, like, we think about, <laughs> we think about, like, <laughs> Patrick Rothfuss and the beautiful prose that he writes, and, like, you know, a lot of other folks, but that's kind of what comes to mind. And Abercrombie's prose is oftentimes, like, he just writes what he needs to write to get the job done and you can almost forget that he can write such like beautiful prose and i think the these this relationship is part of where it shines oh it shines so <laughs> yeah. well and it, it comes back to like you know this pursuit this, this price of uh, what are we calling the price of duty right he's he had to turn his back on Artie growing up to leave the family to pursue yes. a career in the military, knowing what he's leaving behind, leaving her alone with a man, her father, that he knows is abusive, but he's like, I got to get out of here. I've got to, you know, become my own man and I rise the ranks, mm-hmm. anything except going back there, even if it means turning my back on Artie. And now that he's dead and Artie's back in his life, now that the dad is dead and Artie's back in Wes's wife, life, you have this... He's just reminded of that sacrifice that he had to make, that price he had to pay to en- enhance his social status. And already has, you know, she's drinking constantly. She's uh, flirting with Giselle, of all people. It, mm-hmm. it, it's it's clear signs of, I get depression or acting out, you know, a whole kind of complex yeah. stuff going on with Artie. And Wes just can't face it and it's juxtaposed against these moments where everyone's talking about how great wes is first through the breach at the at the orient and then um oriak oriak thank you and then yes, uh, <laughs> and then like how lord marshall burr is insisting that he's a capable military man i want you to be my number two like 
all these things and it's like those are all yes. of his victories and, and and there's a price there's a price to being loyal to the army right and that that's kind yes. of where we're going here yes committing to duty it's interesting we talked to uh, in that uh, favorite mothers episode about the uh, the Tully family words in Game of Thrones, like mm-hmm. uh, Catelyn Stark's family for for our Song of Ice and Fire fans and all that. It's like, and their their words were our family, duty, honor, right? And there's mm-hmm. a moment where uh, Bran Stark says like, eh, uh, like that's the order, right, or something like that. And it's kind of this thing where in in the first law. Uh, and in West's arc in particular here, he's putting duty before family, but yeah, he's oh yeah. telling himself a story about how he's doing it for his family. And all of it, it does boil down to this, like, West, you're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for yourself. And if you want to admit that and that's what you care about, then so be it. But I, I know he's he's just another character for Abercrombie that's like trying really hard to be a good person and doing there's all these moments of him being like he tried to think like he tries to like take on Pharaoh's perspective in the blade itself at one point like she's like scared and she's like lashing out and he's like I wonder what it's like being her right now that's probably really hard so he's getting these moments of of kindness and empathy and then he's getting these like reminders of like look if you really like now it's getting shoved in your face that all you really care about is uh, like you yeah duty and like uh but also this like self reliance and like like proving it's like a proving to yourself like trying to conquer his own insecurity um type thing like a, the pursuit of accomplishment and duty I think. right yeah accomplishment through duty it's so true yeah. and like it, it, it just continues to develop in these later books. But the last thing that we get in the blade itself is this moment with, with Glockta and Glockta's relationship with Wes in this book. Mm. There is this whole piece where hmm. Glockta was upset at Wes because Wes never came to visit him or whatever. And like, oh, like once I became the cripple, everyone stopped trying to hang out with me and and then Wes was like I tried to visit you multiple times I love you buddy and it's like this is another thing of Wes like being the guy that we like he's like of course went went Wes went bun- a bunch of times because he's we, we love Wes and Wes is always doing the right thing right it's a, it's another endearing moment for Wes that is like sandwiched in this Artie moment so it's super interesting he's like I'll Glockta, I need you to watch over Artie while I'm at war. And then Glockta's like, you never visited me. Why would I do anything for you? You're just trying to use me. But yeah. it was a misunderstanding, guys. Glockta's mom was turning Wes away. Wes was like, I went twice. And I was turned away both yeah. times. And Glockta had a little bit of a humbling moment there at the end of this book. And that was just like a cute little thing at the end of this book. I don't know. I liked well, it. It's it more is. for Glockta than it for is. Wes. <laughs> It's more for Glock than for West. I'm trying to think about from the West perspective here, and especially through this, like, lens of duty and stuff. And it's, you know, there's a case to be made of, like, well, West, like, you know, listening to his quote-unquote betters, like, in society and being turned away and not, like, yeah, he went twice, but then Glockta was, like, walking around, like, being a person, and where was West being, like, hey, like, hey, dude, like, I got turned away by your mom. Uh, yeah. Let's, like, let's talk and be friends. So it's, it is interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. I've never really thought about it much because I, 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 this is part of why it's fun to do a West character profile because, like, we're so wrapped up in Glockta as one of our favorite characters in the whole yeah. genre yeah. that it's like, you don't really think about that moment a ton from West's perspective. But yeah, it's kind of interesting where you think, yeah. like, where were you, West? I see it as another yeah. case for us to like Wes and see him as the hero. Where it's like, of yeah. course he went twice, first to the breach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like <laughs> all of these, all of these things about Wes. I, I think Abercrombie's building up his case some more because he's going to hit us with even yeah. more doozies in the. Oh, he will. In, in, in before they're hanged, which I think we're in right now. Let's go. Uh, yeah. It starts with Lord Marshal Burr having to deal with. Good old Prince Lajus lad. And he's like, oh, man, I'm surrounded by these noble buffoons. Wes, I need you to take the prince and I need you to just go off somewhere. Advise him somewhere where there's not going to be a whole lot of battle. All this other stuff. 
So, again, we get Burr making Wes his number two, giving him the job to watch over the prince, keeping him out of the action, trying to. Anyway, we also get these moments where Wes recruits Pike and Cathill um, from a nearby Inquisition prison. And there's these moments where, again, talking about the wes Artie relationship, I believe Wes actually is feels guilty over Artie when he sees Cathal and that prompts him to mm. to rescue these two out of prison and again this is another like noble moment for Wes we're all like go Wes this guy's like <laughs> this, this guy's such a hero you know yeah yeah you do see it and I think a lot of where West benefits is by his juxtaposition against the people around him. It's like yeah. when you're spending time with Polder and the Croy, blade itself, yeah. <laughs> Jazal. Yeah, Polder and Croy. Ladislaw. And Ladislaw, right? It's yeah. like he's spending time with all these people who are just like pampered and incompetent and like uh what's the word like dandies and (laughs) then he's like (laughs) and he's just like (laughs) trying to work hard and trying to be a good person and everyone around him is just spouting nonsense about like heroism and we've got Ladislaw (laughs) with those moments of like yeah shame your like your friend Galacta died West and West (laughs) is like (laughs) <laughs> last lot he's still alive he's in the inquisition and yeah. then the last lot's like oh strange strange and then later he's like oh yeah strange he died and then he's like or like shame he died and west yeah. is just like oh face palm so we yeah. do feel for west mm. that he has to deal with all these people when juxtaposed against these people he feels like a kind of heroic person and at least he's like he's working hard and trying to be a good person which it at, I mean, I feel like Abercrombie's characters, almost all of them are telling themselves a story that they're trying to be a good person, except maybe Black Dow. <laughs> right? Like, uh, but, right. But that being said, and uh, yeah, at least West is working hard. Yeah. And he's taking action and initiative. And I've always respected that about West and appreciated sure. reading that. And I do honestly think he is always trying to do good. You know, he has a lot yeah. of really smart ideas. He's brilliant, and he's willing to work within the system a lot of times, too, to get it done. He's, mm-hmm. he's just clever, and that is always something fun to watch. Uh, you see that we get these moments when you know, we're talking about frustration dealing with Ladislav. There's these moments where Three Trees and his crew scout out some of Bethod's men, and, you know, of course, this is this example where it's just like, this is obviously a trap. And Ladislaw is like, they're insulting us. They're you know, they're affronting us. They're like mooning them and stuff. And uh, Ladislaw can't contain his Ugh. his rage. It's such an obvious trap. But because he's the prince, they have no choice yeah. but to charge. And everyone's chasing glory. You know, that's this whole thing. He wants glory in battle, glory in battle to help my mm. my stance as the prince. And then absolute chaos breaks out it, this this was such an obvious <sighs> trap the army's getting massacred and somehow in the chaos like cathal manages to save wes and then yeah. they are able to save the prince and they manage to escape and run in with dogman i mean it's just like of course Ladslad survives and like he's still stuck with him and now he doesn't have the army yeah yeah, and it's an interesting moment where what with the West saving Laszlo stuff because it's like we know it's such an interesting moment and it is this duty thing that uh, you're you're framing this episode around Charles mm-hmm. with uh, like he he knows that a world without Prince Ladislaw even at this moment he knows it it's probably better big picture which is yeah. interesting yeah. like because obviously you don't well we'll get to the moment later where yeah. he uh spins on that but it, it's like he also as just hates readers <laughs> yes he hates him he hates him he's annoying he's blo- he's all these things and that being said west has this moment where it's like but he's the prince and this is my duty and this is like 
everyone has to worship something type thing. Like, yeah. West is worshiping duty, and duty tells him, save the prince even if he's the worst. And he knows he's the worst, but he saves him anyway. And it's interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, we'll get to the moment where he, he realizes maybe duty is not serving him as much anymore when Ladislaw makes uh, different decisions. But I'll let you, I'll you take it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because before we get there, we have this moment where Wes is, you know, traveling with Cathal, Ladislaw, and the Dogman and crew. And these are interesting moments. We get to see Wes mingling with the Northmen. And we've drawn this mm-hmm. parallel a bunch. It's like when we did the Dogman episode, we were like, oh, yeah. Dogman is a Northern dude who is more sensitive and rolls with the union well. And Wes is a union man who's more rough Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, furious and, and and, and is rolling in with the North crew really well. So it's almost funny. They're like opposite sides of the same coin here. And this is where that becomes a bit more apparent. And I, you know, we had mentioned this in our episode discussion, Dylan, before they're hanged, but I'm like, you know, when Mm -hmm. you're getting praise from black Dow that you should start being (laughs) concerned because black Dow's like, I like this guy. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I love that, Charles. Like slapping him on the yeah. back, giving him pointers, yes. and, and and you're like, oh god, of all the people, Black Dow, because <laughs> Black Dow's like trying to give him advice, and he's fighting it at first, and then you could see the influence that Black Dow's having on Wes, and it culminates in this point where during a raid, Wes bites his opponent's nose off, <laughs> yeah, and and that is the deed that gives him his his name, Furious, and. Mm-hmm. It's such a great name for Wes because we've seen him <laughs> fight with his temper before and we know that Wes is just like under so much pressure sometimes. He's like trying to contain yes. his rage so much just from everyone that he has to deal with. And now that he's hanging out with Black Tao and all these things, <laughs> it's, he's starting to ec- let it that some of that out. <laughs> And like all this bottled rage culminates in him having the fury to bite someone's nose off. And that's not even the tip of the iceberg here, right, Dylan? (laughs) (laughs) No, it's it's not. Um, (laughs) So you point B. Yeah, sometimes when you're just gritting your teeth and bearing everything and you're just so bowed up and then you're like he's in the wilderness with like there's nothing stopping him from just unleashing his inner like bestial side mm. that he has been containing this whole time and it's so he's so bottled up all the time that once it's unleashed it's literally like it is nose biting off levels of fury yeah. and like I love I love that stuff from you Charles about the like when Black Dow starts giving you compliments you know that <laughs> you're heading down a, a dark path here yeah <laughs> yes and they name you they give you a name first yes. of all and which is a huge deal and then it's furious which is so brilliant <laughs> and then you know he further earns that name because we know there's this shocking yes. moment where Wes is coming back from that raid after just biting someone's nose off of their face. Uh, he he sees Ladislaw trying to force himself on Cathal. Yeah. And this is like, you know, it, it's shocking. It's It, it, it makes you... Ladislaw already was one, an incredibly unlikable character, and it pushed him even further. You see what I did there? Pushed him even further into this unlikable mm. category, and it just like unlike when Wes bit the nose off of the guy. This was a very cold, calculated rage. It was. It's just like a. I wrote down without any rage, just a cold will. That that was what I put in the notes. He pushes the crown prince yeah. off the cliff to his death. That right after he just got his name Furious. It's like, oh, this is a fury that's deeper than just this like spur of the action, I'm gonna be really violent. This is like, oh, I'm mad and I will just kill you in cold blood because I'm furious. And Black Dow was like, yeah, all right, <laughs> finally, this is good stuff. And you're like, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. And I do think of it. I, yeah, I see. 
I see you talking about this already, Charles. It's like, you go bite someone's nose off in the middle of the wilderness, and suddenly it dawns on you after your years and years of being a formal military man and listening to duty all the time that maybe there are no rules. And (laughs) maybe, right? Like, you're fresh Mm -hmm. off of, like, Mm -hmm. holy crap, I can just kill someone and bite their nose off. (laughs) And you're like, "Eh." and then you're looking at this, like, this person attempting to rape someone, Mm -hmm. and you are like, this is a horrible person. They just caused a bunch of deaths, and now they're committing sexual assault. And you're like, if you're West, you're in the situation of, like, no one will know and Mm. the world will be better. And this is kind of his moment of like, what has duty even done for me? And he just pushes Laszlo off the cliff. And I don't think he ever regrets it. No. Oh, no way. No, he definitely never even spares Laszlo really much thought after that. He's like worried that he might get caught, but when it's so clear that he's not, uh, he, I mean, he's getting it's, cheered on. Like, Black Dow's, like, patting him on the yeah. shoulder and stuff. Like, finally, you know? What took you so long? Because he's just, has been, like, dead weight for them for a long time. So, it's... For sure. It's interesting. But, you know, in Abercrombie fashion, West basically saves Cathal, kills her would-be, you know, rapist. And then there's this such this brilliant moment when they're back with the Union where West realizes that Cathal is, like, like pursuing a relationship with the dog man. And Cathal just drops this line on him, you're too angry for me. Which no. is like, oh, dude, you're too angry for me. It, like, hits too... Uh. It, like, it, like, shines a light on a part of West's character that he has worked his whole life to to avoid and now that he has feelings for cathal and he's trying to pursue cathal and she just turns him down interesting that she chooses the dogman because we said they're two sides of the same coin Mm -hmm. right so it's like you're just too angry for me it's like oh such a brilliant line (laughs) like the perfect like if you had to summarize wes in one quote you know like that's basically it yeah (laughs) And it's so tough almost when you're in West's perspective and kind of in this place of like, we see how hard he's trying and he actually just, and I'll say there's also this, this trope that it's good to see Abercrombie subvert of like a man saving a woman from sexual assault and then them like feeling obliged to be with that man. Yeah. And I feel like it's a, I want to say how I appreciate that Abercrombie. Yeah. Right. Abercrombie was like, no, like she, like, yes, West did something good by stopping that. Uh, we'll let you speculate on if it was good or not that he pushed, that he killed a person. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to say that is good, but maybe the world was made a better place or whatever. But all that being said, she's, she doesn't owe him, like, that she should now want to be with him. But we have yeah. seen that happen a lot in, in she, She's actually, like... she's like, no, yeah. She's actually yeah. actively not into him from that happening, yes. right? Because, like, I just yes. saw you kill a guy in cold, like, with a cold, determined will. I just watched you push someone off a cliff. Mm-hmm. Yes, they're a horrible person trying to do horrible things to me, but that doesn't make me interested in you now. It makes me scared. Right. <laughs> You're too yes. angry. Fair. And it's, like, totally fair. fair. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, I don't want to be in a relationship with, like, any of you guys. Like, go away. <laughs> Give me the dog, man. He's a nice guy, sensitive, yeah. humble, you know, <laughs> big fan of the yeah. dog, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we all love the dog, man. We and and Cathal, Cathal's great taste. What can we say? The dog, yeah, man. Is, I approve of yeah. Cathal's choice, honestly. The dog, yeah. man, you can't do... Can't do much better than him, honestly. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. But, yeah, that's that was a, such an amazing moment when Wes realizes that they're dating or whatever, they're together, and she just hits him with that, you're too angry. It takes him by yeah. such surprise, such shock. And it's so good because he's been working towards this for so long. He's been interested in Capital for a while. It's, um, it's just... It's just brilliant, and it's a it's a subversion of a trope that I, you can label it grimdark, but to me, it's just like such an honest 
moment and so yeah. true to all these characters in this moment that I have a hard time putting it under like grim dark. It's just like good. <laughs> it's like just drama. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I think that's kind of that's my sense listening to Abercrombie in interviews and things like that is like he I don't think he really sits out with the S word subvert in mind yeah. per se. I think he just like my sense is he like reads books like that do these kind of things i don't think he reads a lot of fancy anymore he says but it uh he reads books that do these kind of things and it's not like someone has to subvert this it's just like a personal reaction of what this isn't what would happen yeah. in reality she would probably be interested in the guy who's this sensitive nice dude and not the guy who just pushed a person off a cliff mm. so i think that's what i think and just because Abercrombie I I see him as a very free thinker in the way that he approaches writing and that's why his work sticks out so much he's such a unique voice and Mm. the it's like the free thinking leads to subversion when something is very well established but doesn't really make sense when you look closely at it and you have a good read on person and character and stuff like Abercrombie does so yeah uh, ama- like another amazing moment yeah, I I agree completely you're so spot on and it's true it, it's some you like you end up subverting common tropes just by trying to write an honest moment for your characters you know yeah it's it's uh, well it's it's super interesting and it's so well done with this West character West subverts this hero trope so often but he's such a real character too it's like not someone's not gonna be a hero all the time like they're gonna ha- okay they have violent outbursts he has a hard time expressing his emotions he can't face a sister you know like all all these things are so fascinating and it it, it, it makes him such an interesting character. I said punching up above his weight, you know, for compared to his screen mm-hmm. time and his impact on the story. There's one more moment in Before They're Hanged uh, that Wes is involved in, and I really enjoy this moment as well. This is the one I where... Really love one. Oh, I love this moment. <laughs> we, we, you, we almost skipped it in our Before They're Hanged I, episode yeah. discussion, but I would not allow that it. That was my fault. Because yes. <laughs> this scene is so good right you have the finally the unions marching on bethod and polder and croy are separated uh polder gets attacked by shanka and fails to engage according to the plan and while that chaos is happening marshall burr throws up black vomit all this like damn this indigestion <laughs> like yeah. we've read this for two books now hundreds of pages burr's been complaining about his <laughs> indigestion so much buildup, and i was not expecting a payoff from that i thought it was like that's just a quirk of bolt of, of lord marshall burr's is that he can't he's got bad indigestion and <laughs> he chooses Abercrombie chooses this moment for the payoff of that, Ugh. where he throws up all this. He just randomly out of nowhere, you know. It has me thinking. There's like moments in Tarantino movies that are kind of like this, where yeah. the narrative's going in one direction, and something insane comes out of left field and totally changes the scene. Uh, I compare Abercrombie to Tarantino a lot. I, I think they both... Me too. Yeah. I think they're they're very similar in a lot of ways, and maybe we can talk about that one day. But... Um, Ooh. I, That's I, brilliant, Charles. I would love to do that. I, I love the two of them for very similar reasons. And there's a scene in Pulp Fiction that I won't get into because I want to spoil Pulp Fiction, but there's a scene that happens in that that reminds yeah. me of this, where something like totally unexpected and random happens, but completely completely shifts the whole narrative of the yeah. scene and the, or the story and in this case it's lord marshall burry's throwing up black vomit and he's passed out and the army it couldn't be a worse time the army is in peak chaos and polder and croy are demanding answers and uh, west decides to cover it up and take command yeah yeah and honestly it is a moment where who else would we want in command than mm-hmm. West here when we've got Polder and Cora as our other options? And we also get the payoff with Pike. As yes, like Pike. Pike's being, there to... Being yeah. morally compromised also as well. Like, here's a guy who is a prisoner that's, like, pretending mm-hmm. to be a soldier and, like, took the, li- the identity of someone else. And, and now 
his, his like him being saved by Wes and Wes giving him a second life and that's all getting paid off in this too it's like yes of course like it fits so well with this character that he would do this at this moment like save Wes's butt in this moment because <laughs> he's just like and it's interesting the, like do not disturb l- the Lord Marshall back off <laughs> it's like oh right. okay. like whoa all right <laughs> like, they don't know what to do it's amazing and we're t- we're talking about this through the lens of duty again. And it's interesting because as we're going through his arc, thinking about it that way, I'm realizing that the moment West's greatest moments in the series are when he explicitly goes against (laughs) duty. Like it's like the moments where it's like, okay, well duty says like the, the Lord Marshall's out of commission and like Polder and Croy, one of them is probably in charge now, but I don't know which, and they're not going to do anything if I let them know this happened. So like the thing I'm going to do is just take matters into my own hands, do a little morally gray move here. And it's a shining moment for Wes. So again, like duty when he's following it tends to make his life worse. And when he's going more for his just own, like, screw it like uh, uh, uh screw it i'll do it live type yeah. stuff <laughs> where he's like i'm gonna take right. i'm i'm in yeah. charge now i'm the captain now basically right he, he <laughs> yes and uh and he that's so true and it's it it feels very abercrombie and to to have this whole mm-hmm. character arc be about duty and the like the price of duty and yet here's someone who will go against it at times and succeed greatly. It, it, it's it's another yeah. one of these clever ironies that gets woven into these characterizations of Abercrombie that you have to call it Abercrombian because you, I haven't read mm-hmm. much like it. And it, it's, yeah. it's so well embodied in Wes because he sees duty as a farce and then sometimes he actually treats it like a farce and then sometimes he's the farce it's like whoa it's, it's, it's like we're, we're getting every angle here it's so beautiful and it, it just comes together in this moment in such a funny uh, clever way so much build up here uh, you know po- the idea of polder and croy being at each other's necks all the time comes comes into play here and like all these armies converging here and three trees fighting Mashenka and the fear yeah. as well. It, it, it's oh, happening God, in these moments. Moment. It's such an amazing moment too. And nothing to do with Wes, but great moment. <laughs> and <Just yeah. laughs> that's how, that's how before they're hanged ends. Um, and the, then to twist it even more, Marshall Burr is alive. The, the battle's over, yeah. and Polder and Croy are like, I demand to see Lord Marshall Burr right now. And was just like, <laughs> well, I'm going to jail. I can't possibly get away with this. And this after, he, he's like, I killed a prince and got away with that. But now, like, my antics are have caught up with me. And Burr just, like, is, like, leaning at this, like, oh okay <laughs> i'm here <laughs> and, like yeah. thanks for following my orders like burr goes along with it he's alive and right. he gives west the pass so west again breaks the law again by assuming command and gets away with it so it's another one of these things of like he got away with killing the prince he's getting away with taking command of the union army and things are looking good for west sometimes you know it, It's yeah, he worked really hard, rose up the ranks the honest way, but he also had these moments in him, like you said, of bending duty and he's willing to play the game too, just as much as anyone else. Yeah. Yeah, and he's probably the one who most that's when he most benefits, is when he's he's down to play the game a little bit. And we do get to in last argument of kings, we get to see him play some games and even have some like interesting uh Moments that would make folks like Glockta and Tyrion proud. So, Oh, yeah. yeah I, I was very impressed yeah. with these. Let's get right into it. I, I sense we're getting yeah. in that direction. Last Argument of Kings. Not as much Wes in this one, but the Wes we do yeah. get is very, very interesting. The You know, the Union Army is deciding they're going to march on the high places to relieve the Northmen. You know, the Northmen are baiting Bethod out in this kind of last stand movement. And... Burr's like, I'm proud of you, West. You're like my son, you know, and you're like, oh God. <laughs> you know, the kind of scenes that follow something like this. And, you know, Burr, of course, the irony dies peacefully in his sleep, mm. right? With a smile on his face. So you're like, oh boy. 
And this is like right before they're supposed to march out to relieve the Northmen who are engaged in a hopeless battle against Bethod, relying on the Union army to come and relieve them and end the war, right? All they have to do yeah. is march there and, and overpower them. But Polder and Croy do not care. They refuse to march until a new Lord Marshal is appointed. They're so committed to the bureaucracy and to hating each other that they refuse to do the right thing in this moment and be like, we'll figure it out. We need to relieve our northern brethren. It's like, no, who's in charge? I need to know. It's got to be me. Great yeah. moment. And they're like going to stand still for days waiting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's a tough time for West over there. And he, we know it. All West he wants to do is, is march. Yes. Oh, yeah. West is a character. I talk a lot about how I like proactive characters on this uh, on this podcast here, and I always appreciate that about West is that he's someone who he's a man of action, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. likes to do things, and that doing of things is how he's been able to rise up the ranks. And he's surrounded by all these people who are not used to having to do things to be successful because they're just nobles. So right. these moments of him just like being frustrated with the fact that no one wants to do anything and they're all caught up on their own. I should be the Lord Marshal BS while West is like, March, do things, please. <laughs> yes. It's like that. I, I always appreciate that about West. I, so yeah, but we, mean, do a, a we do get a, we do get a letter like from the King, us. right? Yeah. Oh, yes, we do. And and all that likability really pays off for Wes because <laughs> he becomes appointed Lord Marshal because, you know, Jazal had a hissy fit at the High Council. <laughs> and so they're like, OK, fine, Jazal, like whatever you want. And so Wes is Lord Marshal, like the pinnacle of status. And he's achieved it. He almost can't believe it. And right. But what he does afterwards, he immediately like fills those shoes you know he he sets out to pit polder and croy against each other yeah and you know we get to see like you know pike gets to laugh at this too where he has this (laughs) fake letter he calls them in one of the time and he's like polder like i spoke to croy and we decided to keep you but only if you behave and he goes croy i spoke to polder (laughs) and we agreed to keep you but only if you behave and they hate each Polder and Corey hate each other so much that they would never like compare notes to see that there's a ruse yes. going on. They're just so afraid <laughs> of, of losing to the other that they go along with it. And to Wes's credit, it, it succeeded. He's, he was able to mobilize the army quickly and get these guys to stop bickering for two seconds. Right. And I love I love those moments because it's so it's so interesting to see West put on his political machination hat and do these kind of moves and he's very uh, he almost like indulges in it in a way that would make someone like glock well i don't know if glock Glock doesn't indulge almost like casca like make casca proud of like have a little fun with it because he's like uh, oh polder here are the amazing things that i really admire about (laughs) croy and he goes on and on he's like it's so great in all these ways and he's like ah what a man you, on the other hand, yeah. and then he, he yeah. does that to both. It's so good. I, I love that. Yeah, and then, like, and... Abercrombie's most like, he has the same letter. It doesn't even say anything yes. on it. You know, he's like, what's the letter? It's like, Pike's like, what's the letter he says? He's like, nothing. It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> and he's like, whoa, right. you're, you're really, you're really, like, gambling on that these guys aren't going to talk to each other, that they aren't going to see the letter. And it's like, yeah, of course yeah. they're not. <laughs> so another like endearing moment for Wes. Again, this sense of duty and he, he can navigate the political spectrum really well. And I always love these clever moments. Like when a character can genuinely be clever and I can appreciate the character for their cleverness. Like you said, a Glockta moment or a Tyrion moment. Wes, like this is a great moment. So well done yeah. by Abercrombie to, to think up this whole scenario because it works so well. And right. it works with he's built up Holder and Croy for this long, and they've never been able to mobilize or cooperate or anything. And and Wes has it figured out here. So super interesting to see that going. Um, so finally, the troops are mobilized thanks to Wes's ruse, and they're able to route Bethod from the high places, chase him back to Carleon, and that's where we get the Logan versus the Feared. 
and Wes holds a shield for Logan, which is yeah. interesting. Wes and Logan have had this kind of admirable relationship, you know, the mutual respect with each other uh, since bef- the blade itself, where they had that like banquet dinner and they were, you know, bonding over you know battles in the north and things like that and. West yeah. uh, cheats. <laughs> he he cheats in the duel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll say that it's another moment that the tides turn on West turning his back on the duty. And we, it's, a, it's always interesting in an Abercrombie novel because it's like you do root, or I find that I root for the the point of view characters, uh, even if I, like, even if I kind of know that a lot of them are not the best people, it's like, well, neither are the people they're fighting against. So yeah. it's like, you might as well root for the people whose heads you're in and you yeah, at least yeah, understand yeah. where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we're lo- root or I think most people have the experience of rooting for Logan in that duel. And then it becomes kind of West playing this fun part in Logan's, huge victory and that duel just gives me chills i mean there's that the bloody nine or or, yeah it's like uh something like logan laughed and the bloody nine laughed with him or something like that and i remember reading that line just chills so (laughs) it yeah great moment and great contribution to west again by defying duty which would be to just hold the hold the shield Yes, just to hold the shield and not get involved. But Wes sees the like dangling little strap, and he's like looking the other way. It's that meme with the puppet where it like looks to the side and then looks forward. Like, not me. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, basically it, yes. Wes holding the shield <laughs> for it. Logan. He's just like, why? Well, I, I didn't pull anything. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's like a, a, like Logan stabs Fenris the Feared under the arm. Uh, Wes. Looking away, looking back. Oh, I don't know. You're like Sims. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> Charles, yeah, you can drop one of those on social media. Yeah, that's a spicy I mean, meme. I guess you, you might like see a, on social yeah, media. Yeah, it's a spicy meme. <laughs> yeah, you got. Well, think about spoilers or whatever. But that's a fun one. I, yeah. I like it. Yeah, that's so. a fun one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Wes when Logan stabs the feared in the wall. It's like. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, fun, fun moment. And again, this idea that when Wes like kind of bends his duty, he can get ahead. He's someone who both chases and admires and respects duty enough where he's like abandoning his family, but he's also willing to cheat it uh, at these opportunistic moments, you know? So such an interesting duality to his character. It's like he's Mm. chasing duty his whole career and like what he's lived by. And he also isn't afraid to bend it as well. And I feel like such an honest, lots of characters are like characters, actual people are like this. So Mm. I always just thought that Wes as a character was so honest in many ways because we got to see this, like for no reason other than just like it was tempting and what is he gonna do have logan lose so when he could like just undo his <laughs> trap like maybe it'll help i right. don't know so it's like yeah go for it Wes. like yeah you're the, supposed to be the hero guy but we're rooting for you in these moments too it's super interesting so logan defeats the feared fantastic frees up the mm-hmm. uh, frees up the union army to return to midderland just to engage the Gurkish now because they are putting Adjua under siege and West becomes you know this battle's crazy West leads the charge he's doing a great job Holder and Croy are very brave in battle like you could argue that West's ability to get them to focus on the task at hand and not bicker with each other caused them to be like extra brave in these moments and they led very com- like um, capable charges I remember you know they were all very brave and West becomes injured, and when the Tower of Chains collapses because of Baez's uh, powerful Juven's ritual (laughs) with the seed in the Square of Marshals, right? Greater than (laughs) Juven's! We're we're trying to mimic the great Uh, Stephen Pacey here, the narrator for these books. uh, does such a great Baez in these moments where Baez is channeling the seed. I am greater than Juven's. I'm greater than Eos himself. 
<laughs> Charles, I'm telling you. If the, I don't know. You might have a you might have a career ahead of you as an uh, audiobook narrator. Dude, I feel like day. after listening got to the Stephen voice. Pacey, there's nothing left. You know, <laughs> he's, he's... <laughs> you don't have. No one's gonna hit Pacey levels. It's but like why know. why hire anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the guy's busy. <laughs> They're going to need to have more audiobook narrators, <laughs> unless we can clone Stephen Pacey and just yeah. have him do. Yeah, yeah, or just record right. enough of his voice so like Siri, you can just get him to read stuff. <laughs> I would, can you imagine? <laughs> I wish my Siri sounded like Stephen Pacey. Oh I, yeah, that would be I awesome. just never talk to anyone else, I just talk to Siri all day. <laughs> I'd still, I'd still talk to you, Charles, don't oh, you worry. I, I'd still, I'd take... Yes, I was getting a little worried there. Not gonna lie, but I'm glad to hear that you'll make an exception. Because like Wes, like yeah, you're not above bending the rules a little bit, right? So a little bit, just a little, bit. <laughs> just a little bit, and for good reasons, you know. Yes. So these are these moments, right? Wes is this is the most admirable you can get is charging into these things. Baez is literally tearing the city down, and Wes is living up to his duty, leading the charge. And where does that end him? In a hospital tent. And he's in this hospital tent. He's, like, not looking so good. And who's there is Artie at his bedside. Oh. And it's at these moments when there's nothing left that the two are finally able to reconcile. And it's like Wes's price for duty was his life, ultimately, right? Like, he was the command the lord marshal and he led this defense of adjua and it costed him his life and all that he wanted to do on his deathbed was to reconcile with Artie. and it's this moment where it was like dude you didn't have to go to war and (laughs) die from a wasting disease Mm. to reconcile with Artie, but in some cases he did and that's what makes these last moments I remember my first read through I read I'm like that's it like <laughs> it, yeah. almost, it almost feels empty in, in, in ways but then you read it and you're like that's kind of the point when you yes. think about how futile duty is and like stature uh, and like war. status and war and violence and yeah. bureaucracy and like um nationalism right. and all these other things it's like like at the end of it it's he wasted away everyone said he was a good man wes he he was a good man and it's tragic what happened to him you know and we know he wasn't fully good but we were Mm. rooting for him so it, it, it makes these last moments feel a bit abrupt and and it makes it feel wasteful that's well said wasteful uh and he's wasting away as well and Mm. it's you know these moments his hair is falling out and Artie's just looking at him why it's uh it says uh eyes wide with horror as this Mm. is happening and it's just yeah we've talked some uh, on here about how people often do have the reaction to the end of the first law trilogy with a sort of like wait what like yeah. uh, it come it ends like that because that emptiness is a very normal reaction especially to the end of west's arc mm-hmm. and then the di- like to uh, the part of why we love the first law trilogy is because we know that that emptiness is deliberate and intentional on abercrombie's part where it's like if you stop and think about things like what we deal with in fantasy novels like war and like what is basically the equivalent of like uh bias using nuclear warfare it's like yeah. and there duty are and honor just going too. to be and duty and honor as concepts like um you know chasing those and forgetting to actually uh focus on the relationships and the people who are important around you like these nebulous ideas like duty mm-hmm. and it's like well, now you chased duty forever. You died and you got like just a few moments at the end to spend with your sister who you both really care about each other. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't know. It's just sad and empty and all these things in a way that 
you know, our, hopefully we can take some sort of lessons and like that's what part of the beauty is like we don't have to go the way of West. Like we can mm-hmm. care about duty enough where we work hard at things and whatnot uh, um, and we try to do the right thing. But we can also remember that like, hey, if you have a, a sister you really care about or a lifelong friend like you and me, Charles, <laughs> yes. it's like, <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, like – like stop and think for a second like all this chasing and duty and this achievement and all stuff it's like stop and just connect with the people around you while you still have time and that's you know that emptiness for me after reading it i don't know how many times now three or four is usually what i say because i can't remember it's like after that that emptiness to me is just a reminder of like hey don't get caught up on your like chasing these nebulous ideas and and pay attention to the people because that's where West wanted to be by the end, even though he didn't make it. Right. It reminds me of certain lines in Game of Thrones, which I almost said, mm. but I'm not going to because it's spoilers and I don't think it's okay. fair to spoil Game of Thrones. But I think you know what I'm talking about, where it's like, oh, like this character oh, yes, yes, was yes. honorable and this character this and right. then this character <laughs> that, you know? So it's like, yes. I don't want to. <laughs> I think a lot of, like, you hardly said anything, Charles, but if uh, I think a lot of people would be like me and be like, yep, yep, yep. I, I think most people getting to the yeah. end of our West character profile have probably watched Game of Thrones <laughs> or read the, the Song of Ice and Fire books. So, but um, I do agree. Don't, don't yeah, spoil it, but I think they know which I'm character. Right. Where it was like yes. this character was honorable and stuff <laughs> happened, you know. Something so bad like, happened. It, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, you know, that's it's a very similar thing, but for Wes, like Wes's death was just so inconsequential, you know. I don't right. want to spoil all quiet in the Western Front either, but it's this idea of like Ooh, Charles. just because like not every death is a noble death or a meaningful death, especially in war. Mm. And so you're like, the fact that Wes's death was almost an afterthought and quiet and pointless and wasting over a long period of time and sickly. It wasn't this like brazen charge into glory. It wasn't even like, oh, and he was buried under the rubble, never to be seen again. If only I could reconcile with my dear brother. (laughs) Like, it's like... No, he was there, and it's just a very unspecial, unclimactic yeah. death. And, I mean, it, it's at the expense of this reading experience, but it's it's worth, like, Abercrombie commits to it, and it's worth that price of, like, yeah, it's not this aha, well, brilliant moment, but it is an honest moment so true to this character and so true to this thesis that he's been crafting over three books now and you just right you, you it couldn't end any other way and it's, it's 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 fantastic and it's different for that and i that's what makes these books stand out so much for me and in, in the world of modern fantasy it's like come on who else is doing this it's like yeah to have this hero gallant character and then give him these horrible tendencies and then kill him off in the most unfulfilling way imaginable. It's bold, but it's, it's had to happen. Fantastic. Yeah, that's so well said, Charles. I agree. And I'm Yeah, and you dropped all quiet on the Western front? Yeah. I mean, was that, was that Mr. Miller's class? <laughs> Maybe. I don't think so, though. I think it was Bosley's <laughs> class, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean the whole point of that i book think i was... did the spark notes on that one in high school to be, but you to know be how honest, it ends Charles. right so this this like this theme no, i forgot don't... oh well whatever it's this whole theme <laughs> we'll talk about off the air. i don't want to spoil all choir on the western front for you <laughs> but there's this theme in it that like not every soldier's death was a meaningful one or a purposeful one sometimes okay. people just died and it was anticlimactic and almost wasteful sure and the idea, oh, I don't want to get into it because I, I don't know if I'm, yeah, if well, it's worth spoiling yeah. all quiet on the Western no, no, Front, I'm no, not going to no, do that. Don't do it, Charles. Because so, <laughs> I was be like, and that's that's all, no, but so I, I won't get into it. But for those of you that Just have read All Quiet on the Western themes, Front yeah. and the First Law Trilogy, you know what I'm talking about. This and is you're for like, you. This guy is like, wow, <laughs> he's coming at me with these takes I was not ready for. So you're yeah, welcome. Right. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, you are welcome. I think that's 
you know, we're hitting a good time mark here. And we've made it to the end of the trilogy. We've talked about Wes's um, mm-hmm. expected death at the end of this book. And, you know, it's... it's Wes surprises me always. He's I gotta say he's one of my favorite characters, even though he's not necessarily like yeah. anywhere near the most popular. But I, I, he came in last in our poll. Yeah, when, he, right on not Twitter. Fair. He has some. That's why I say he punches above his weight. He has so many great moments. I, I can't do him dirty like that. But he's he is a great character. He's one of my favorites. I enjoy reading him, and I enjoyed talking about him. With my Aww. lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. It's always a pleasure to do these character studies with you. Thanks, Charles. I'm super grateful for the opportunity to, to, <laughs> to chat First Law with you, mm-hmm. as we've been doing for a long, long time, but now to do it in a way where other people are... are it still blows my mind, <laughs> like, interested <laughs> in hearing. Um, but thank... Yeah, Charles, always such an absolute pleasure to to chat mm-hmm. with you and yeah it's it's so much fun it's first law it's talking about Jarvis Crombie first law I mean, what, what could we ask Crombie, guys yes any excuse to talk about this terrific trilogy yes. we are game four and yeah we're gonna be talking more first law universe very soon I mean we're mm-hmm. reading all the standalones now we're working our way through the age of madness trilogy hopefully in time for wisdom of crowds when that's popping off in September so Stick around, guys, for all your First Law-related content. You're not going to want to miss it yes. here on the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast. That is true, Charles. Yes, <laughs> yes it yeah, is. Yes, so we've got the heroes coming up. We've got the heroes <laughs> <laughs> We've got the heroes yeah. coming up, Red Country after that, and we'll start getting, uh, oh, geez, then there's, there's chatter about sharp ends. The there's chatter short about story sharp anthology. ends. There's chatter um, about, then, uh, what is it, Trouble with Peace? Is that the first one? A Little Hatred. Oh, A Little Hatred. Then it's Trouble with Peace. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I am so but, excited. Yeah. And then, I'm so excited. Yeah. We're going to record the heroes soon, and this is the first one that I have get to read and talk to with dylan so this is like our, it's gonna be yes. our first time talking about this book it's gonna and be I've, so much fun uh, <laughs> and i've been sitting here like west way <laughs> like stomping around oh, wanting God, to don't march get furious on me please <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been, you know, gritting my teeth and being like, dude, I've been wanting to chat about the heroes with you for years. I so so you will hear the culmination of all that. Uh, luckily, we're on a Zoom call, so I don't think I can bite Charles's nose off. He's probably <laughs> safe. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's going to be a very fun conversation and I, I can't wait to have it and then share it with you all. So it's going to be yeah, so uh, another, much fun. Yeah. But until then, guys, I think we just got to go ahead and play that sweet, sweet outro music. What do you think, Dylan? I think we got to get that sweet, sweet outro music pumping, Charles. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. This has been your co-host, Charles and Dylan. Guys, if you like what you heard today, if you love the First Law Trilogy, if you want to engage with us in any way, well, the best way to do that is over on social media, especially Twitter at the FTF Podcast with a number one at the end and on Instagram at the FTF Podcast. Now, Dylan, Mm -hmm. if they like what they heard today, and they want to support the show even further than following us and engaging with us on social media and they just so happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, what can they do? Toss five stars to our podcast. Just find that Friends Talking Fantasy page on the Apple Podcast app. Click the Friends Talking Fantasy page. Scroll down past all those episodes until you start seeing stars. Once you're seeing stars, the optimal number of stars to click to support the show would be five of them. If you've got a little bit of extra time and you want to go that next step of support, writing review is super helpful for a podcast like ours. But... Just listening is Just more than listening. enough. Guys, thank you. thank you so much for listening. We greatly appreciate it. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends.